Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at the Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. There was an item recently on the Naked Scientists podcast about pi. The value you get when you divide the circumference of a circle by its diameter. It comes out at about, as you know, 3.14. Or at least that's what I was taught at school. But the exact decimal value has never been resolved. The item was called, Does Pi Really Go On Forever? One of the cool things about pi is, technically, all of our birthdays are there. All our <laughs> date of death, all our, our date of engagement, our favourite number. This is Bobby Seagull a Cambridge mathematician speaking on the original podcast. Our recipe, our sort of our favourite mathematical recipes for cakes, everything is inside pie. The uncertainty surrounding such a basic mathematical concept got us thinking about uncertainty in science, in philosophy and in religion. It's a common assumption that uncertainty is a sign of failure. In fact, experiencing uncertainty is central to science, philosophy, religious faith and, dare I say it, politics too. With me to discuss this topic are Julian Hubbard, Fellow of Jesus College Cambridge and Director of their Intellectual Forum, Julian Hargreaves, Senior Research Fellow here at the Wolf Institute, and Elaria Benocchi from the Department of Art History at the University of Cambridge. Welcome everybody. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Julian Hargreaves. I think you've got something to say about Pi. I've got a little bit of something to say about Pi. So we're thinking about um, uncertainty and um, we're using pi as our sort of point of departure. And I uh, thought it was an interesting fact about pi is that in the 1700s, pi was thought of as an irrational number. And that means it's a number that cannot be expressed as a ratio of two whole numbers. So some of us might have learned at school that pi is 22 divided by seven. But of course, we know that's just an approximation of pi. Now, in the 1880s, it was classified again. It was categorized again. And, um, it was categorised because it was thought of as uh, a number which cannot be expressed using algebra. Now you might think, so what? So but what? Every integer we think of, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and onwards, can be expressed in some way or other using algebra. Now, pi is part of a set of numbers which can't. And what do we call numbers that can't be expressed using algebra? We call them transcendental numbers. Nice. So the pi, uh, the value of pi exists within the spiritual world. So there we are. So uh, the naked scientists wanted us to think about their topics through the lens of ethics and philosophy and religion. And within the first two minutes, we've related science to the world of spirits. In some ways, uh, and I hate to be the sort of prosaic scientist here, um, I'm not sure pi is a good example of uncertainty. We are as certain about pi as we feel like being. Um, for Pi Day earlier this year, um, which is, you know, it's American speak, so it's the 14th of March, um, they still get it wrong, um, <laughs> somebody calculated Pi to 3.14 trillion digits. You know, we could do another few more if we felt like it. Um, there are formulae which will tell us it exactly. We can, you know, we, we have it so accurately that if you used, you know, 15 decimal places, if you went all the way around the world, you'd measure it correct, you know, you'd measure that distance of 25,000 miles off by a molecule. You need 40 digits to get the entire visible universe, a circle that big, right to the size of an atom. You know, so it, we already have it far more accurately. We are far, 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 far more certain about it than we could be if we want to be. And if we want to know anything more, we can literally just work it out. Mm. But we will never get there, will we? Um, but if you look at a third as a decimal, it's 0.333, and you don't get quite to the end. Right. But it's not very exciting to say that we haven't quite got to the end yet. Yeah, there, yes, there's some more threes to come. But it's not that exciting. But what makes Pi exciting then? I suppose the mystery around it, isn't it, in a way? The mystery of whether it goes on forever, the mystery of the fact that it can't be, for the sort of layman, it can't be expressed using these um, measures that we're all familiar with, you know, fractions, ratios, integers. All so to me, it's the fact that it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah and I actually, so. that comes to some of the art things. You know, if you take E, another really important transcendental number, and you raise it to, to the power of pi times i, the square root of minus one, an imaginary number, and you add one, you get zero. I mean, that, to me, yeah. is one of the most beautiful things in mathematics. This is so mind-blowing, and it makes me think, this idea of certainty and uncertainty, and actually the idea of fraction, makes me think about something very basic, which is the keyboard, and the ideas of tones and semitones. And 
when Bach arranged the keyboard and decided what tones and semitones that were in mathematical terms, he found that the semitones added some level of uncertainty. There was this liminal space in between tones that makes you feel higher or lower, and that's how you, you build you know, a minor or major you know, tone for the music. And that's actually this sense of you know, impermanence, of uncertainty, of not knowing where you go. And it's actually both a mathematical and a musical concept and something that has something spiritual, of course, in Bach. So, you know, And does fraction. that add to the beauty? I mean... Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you had just the white keys, that's a type of music. But if you add the black keys, that's when music becomes complicated. And that's how Bach complicates and makes it more complex, more transcendental, more interesting and more you know, even godly, because in Bach it was about God. So, yes, uh, uncertainty, I would say, at least in music, and these semitones add to the complexity and the beauty. I think there is something very religious about uncertainty, and that's something that I personally embrace, because religions, all religions, recognise the flawed nature of truth as humans understand it. So this uncertainty is part of the religious experience. Uh, there, there are certain particularities of faith, if you like, that each faith has, um, whether as a Christian in the, 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 the death, life, death and resurrection of Christ, the world's changed. There are certain particularities, but that uncertainty is part of the religious experience. So I'm quite intrigued by the fact that pi goes on forever. I'm quite intrigued that it's pi rather than three point, you know, a third, 0.333. There is something quite exciting about 3.14. One five nine two six five three five. <laughs> as far as I can go, that is a scientist. Um, but there is something quite, 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 quite profound about that. So we've got something that's beautiful. We've got something that's profound. Uh, does this demonstrate the sort of close relationship between science and religion, or science and art? Well, um, I'm sure that uncertainty and uncertainty has often been used, even spatially, in art to push people, push an audience to think about the transcendental, to think about God, and to think about himself and God. So um, if I think about the Baroque church, a church that is not central, that is not squared, that has a space that seems to uh, become bigger and smaller according to where you go, this makes you feel uncertain about your position, uncertain about the space, uncertain about the geometry of where you are, and uncertain about your own experience of reality. And so I think Yes, uncertainty has always been considered important, particularly in some key periods when theology was developing quite intensely, um, to stimulate the thought about who we are and where we are in the world and where we're going. So our relationship with God is an important part of that, of course. And that uncertainty is important to science as well, though, isn't it, Julian, in your work? The yeah, I mean, I work a lot with statistics, and I think people who look at statistics from the outside in often think that we deal with sort of black and white facts and and results that we're 100% confident about and we've sort of categorised the world in very certain concrete terms. But of course, inbuilt into every decent statistical project are lots of measures of uncertainty. So we can think about one that people might be familiar with is the, the confidence interval, which in sort of layman's terms says that if we were to repeat the process uh, many, many times, then 95 out of 100 times, the true value of whatever it is we're interested in would be found between a range of uh, two other values. Now, that, of course, suggests that for 5% of the time, it's outside it. Where outside it, in layman's terms, we'd be very uncertain about. Um, similarly, when we finish a statistical project, we report... Um, how much of the world, if you like, we've captured in our, in our model. So if we're interested in uh, how good people are at football and we've got some factors which might predict that, like uh, height or... Uh, speed. Speed or whatever, whatever it is. Um, we report that we have found a certain percentage of that variance, which of course means the other percentages are missing. So... There we are. And actually, if the model, uh, if the sort of certainty measure is too high, then a lot of statisticians start to feel a bit uncomfortable with that because they think that actually we're just describing the sample and not the wider population. Isn't this where, the, where there's a problem when 
the outcome of, say, Julian's work then has to be delivered to the wider public. There's a number of issues here, and sometime we can have a theological debate about Bayesian statistics, oh, yeah, of which course, is yeah. you know, clearly the superior way to do of these course, things. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is also a problem, I think, even before you get there, of just how we use language. And the technical language that is used around science, around statistics, and the way those same words are used in other areas. So, you know, in science you'll talk about error bars. And now the concept of an error has a very specific meaning scientifically. In common language, it means you got something wrong. You know, an error bar in an experiment is not reporting on, on something you did wrong. It's not that if you were a bit better or more skilled, there wouldn't have been those. Um, you know, when you talk about uncertainty, um, you can be pretty sure of something and be able to talk about the uncertainty or the confidence intervals. Mm. It doesn't mean you're not confident in it or not certain about it. So there's a real problem with translating language. I think in terms of, of policy development, there's then a real problem as well because you're trying to solve problems that are not well defined often. Um, the question I often ask people is, what's the point of education? You know, the four of us sat around this table would probably have different views on what education is for and hence how we work out whether it's going. So even if we have a brilliant experiment which tells us exactly the effects of doing various things, we don't know if it's the right thing to do or not. So help me now. I'm just this ordinary person listening to, w listening to you, and I want to know whether I should do something or not. Should I believe in something you're working on or not? I just want a simple answer. I just want to be told what to do or what to think. I may question you, but I just want to be to told it in, in simple language. I don't want error bars. I don't want confidence intervals. I just want to know. Um, so I think there is a lot of it. David Spiegelholt has talked a lot about how to communicate these things. Some things we're really sure of. Um, uh, does smoking increase your chance of getting cancer? You know, yeah, it, it, it would be astonishing if that was just, you know, decades of sheer coincidence. Um, so some things we're pretty sure of. Sometimes it's, you know, we're not quite sure. Um, there are then real problems when you get into medicine, particularly with rare things. And there's a big issue around um, statistics and accuracy of rare predictions. It's actually really hard often to say exactly in a very short sentence, this is definitely right, this is definitely wrong. Um, and we have to sometimes say, look, we're pretty sure about this and we can tell you the details if you want. And sometimes you have numbers which seem simple, but which might be interpreted differently. So my favourite sort of statistic that I sort of always smile at is the one about the likelihood of rain. So you often get a weather report <laughs> and it'll say there's a 30 percent chance of rain. Now, what do you do with that? I mean, do you go out with a T-shirt? Or do you go out with an umbrella, you know, 30% chance of rain? Is that likely or not? I mean, who knows? You're listening to Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. This week, I'm joined by Julian Hubbard, Julian Hargreaves and Alaria Benocchi. And we're discussing the value of uncertainty in science, philosophy and religion. Curiously enough, um, even art historians struggle sometimes with, you know, issues of for instance, attribution is a very contested issue. When you have to um, ask a museum or advise a museum on whether to buy a painting or not, or the National Trust in some cases, or you know, a, a client if you work for an auction house. And sometimes we know in art history that connoisseurship or the art of recognizing the hand of a specific painter at work in a, in a, in a, in a painting or in a sculpture, it's a very subtle thing. We have a, a whole jargon to say this is school of Raphael, this is Raphael, this is attributed to Raphael. And sometimes people say, well, should I spend two million pounds on this? Should I spend 200,000 pounds on this? What's the point? How do you advise me? Um, it's very difficult. And, and in fact, you, you can inform your client or the museum about how close they are to a full attribution, but there will be someone who's going to say, oh, that's not Raphael, that's not Michelangelo, you've wasted two million pounds, you've wasted three million pounds. The interesting thing in some cases for us is the debate. Sometimes you can absolutely tell. Sometimes you have exams, you have, you know, x-rays. Most of the times is about how well we know some artist's oeuvre, what we do with it, how we can argue for it. And so far from certain, even what we see museums today labeled as this or that in 50 years time might change and, you know, deprice or, you know, increase in value according to that. So uh, uncertainty is a daily part of our job 
and of our research. And we have to, at some point, make a position and, and take the risk. So now that, when so. I go into the Tate, I can <laughs> see little signs saying that this is 70% certain. Absolutely. Well, well, if we were correct, yes. Most, perhaps for old masters more than, but for antiquity, absolutely, absolutely. We have forgeries. There are forgeries everywhere. People come up every now and then saying they found a new Caravaggio or they found a new Michelangelo. And, you know, artists don't tend to say, oh, yet another one or a new drawing by, by Leonardo. And it's very difficult because people want to believe that it is true, want to see that. But you know that you're always, you know, the assessment is always based on teeny tiny thing, the way they draw the nail, the way they draw the hand, the way the eyes are, are drawn. And you don't know these people. They lived 500 years ago. So there's still stuff we don't know ourselves. <laughs> and does technology make that easier or more difficult? I thought with the sort of days of... Um you know, looking uh, underneath the layers of paint and whatnot. Uh, right. I think it can make it more confusing, in fact, mm -hmm. because some artists, even the most well-known artists, do change technique. So if we stick too rigidly to a certain idea we have about their own technique, we're not researching them anymore. We're pre-establishing the way they worked. And so you can, you know, um, make discoveries less likely. So sometimes you have to be very flexible in what you think you know about but, them. But there's also a difference between proof and disproof. Oh, yes, you know, absolutely. It, it, it's often, you know, particularly with new techniques, easy to say, look, we're really sure this isn't by that person because this yep. thing was only made, you know, 100 years later. Yes, absolutely. Proving it was absolutely there is... It's, 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 yeah, completely different. Um, yeah, well, the negative is always easier, isn't it, to, to, to prove something's yeah. not, not possible. I was just wondering, listening to Laria, whether I believe in God 80% or 90%. <laughs> is I mean, the school of yeah, attributed that's to true. I mean, a miracle of... But there yes. are times, as a, going back to the religious question, there are times as a person of faith that I question, fundamentally question. Um, and uh, actually, that only reinforces what I said earlier, that there's some value in the uncertainty even from, from a religious perspective. So do you think there's something to be learned for people of faith from looking at science? Or is there, is there a two-way relationship available, do you think? I think that, well, I think there is something to be learned. Um, I mean, I, I, I think this, uh, this question that perhaps religious people expect certainty from their texts, for example, sometimes those who want to see the literal meaning of the text, you know, and it's good to be reminded that, you know, sometimes I, I kind of, I do want to stone my rebellious son, but it's probably, you know, it's not a good, it's not a good idea anymore. Um, and, and Julian, as a scientist and humanist, how do you, how do you sort of reconcile issues of certainty within people of faith? And um, So to me, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very staunchly an atheist and I've never seen any reason to raise my probability of above sort of you know, zero. Above zero, um, really? You, you, you'd, you'd, go to, you'd stay at zero, I, would you? I, I'd stay at zero, but be prepared to change that if new information came along. Um, and so given the information so there so is far, no possibility no possibility without, you new, would, information, without new information I'll, let me just push yeah. you a moment because you were just saying how much easier it is to reject something you know rather than to affirm it but you are actually doing that by saying there is no possibility of a divine being a god of some kind and you're saying for you it's zero I'm saying it's sufficiently close to zero that it may as well be zero. But it's which not. Is not the, which is not the <laughs> same. But it, let's say somebody says, look, I've got this fair coin, I'm going to toss it. And they toss it 100 times in a row and it comes up as heads. Mm -hmm. Would you say, well, you know, I guess there's some chance that just happened by coincidence? Or would you say, look, there's something wrong with your coin? And so to me, <laughs> it's so small that I'm in that there's something wrong with your coin. Um, I don't believe in that coincidence. But... If you did something else, you toss that coin another hundred times and it looks more normal, then I'd be prepared to change. But it's this question of how close to zero are we? Um, you know, do you believe in Thor? What's your percentage chance of Thor uh, being real? What's your percentage chance of Shiva being real? You know, you can go through... Oh, we go to the gods. Deity. I thought about the weather for um, a <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so I suspect most of us would set our probabilities for most of those as zero, you know, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and if uh, and so for me, that's where my belief in any other god is. That doesn't mean if Thor didn't appear in this room and start insisting on taking part of this podcast with hammer and everything, we wouldn't rethink that. <laughs> but for now, it's your normal hypothesis, that's happen. isn't it? Um, well, from my point of view, being used to deal with materials that are extremely ambiguous, I think I've developed an extreme confidence in staying with ambiguity all the time and uncertainty. Personally, I used to be um, a Christian, a Catholic, and I've become atheist with time, and I'm now quite firmly an atheist. However, I've learned to appreciate by studying the humanities that there is a poetic truth that sometimes eludes our 
direct approach to things. And there is a poetic truth to the Bible, for instance, and it doesn't make me discard it entirely as a text, even though I'm not a Catholic anymore. So I still allow a possibility for something to surprise me in a poetic sense. There are some things that I cannot explain except for amazement. So, and, it's, and, that's, and that's the way we, in which we have to read art. We have to, at least art and literature and poetry, we have to admit for some room for our imagination and our reaction to it, mm. even though this is Raphael, this is not Raphael. In the end, it's either Raphael or not Raphael, but there are more inspired copies and less inspired copies. It's, it's all a bit that. And the Bible is a great example of great literature. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, some of it's more inspired and some of it's <laughs> yes. you know, less exciting to read. But there are some fascinating passages there, and the way that's evolved over time is really, really interesting. I'd, I'd agree in that way, yes. But I think Laura's saying more than just a fascinating piece of literature, something that actually... Is, has a profundity that makes you think in a way that's unexpected? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There is a truth that sometimes is grasped. There may not be my truth or my way to describe the truth, but it's truth nonetheless. And so I have to be ready to welcome it sometimes. Now, one of the terms that comes to me, and I'm looking at, at, um, at Julian Hargreaves here, is that the leap of faith. You asked about the relationship between science mm. and religion. And, of course, in, in religion, there's a certain leap of faith, you know, Kierkegaard mm. and so on. Is that the same also in, in science? Your, your statistical methods, yeah. you ask certain questions. You, think you have an instinct that actually I'm leaping here. Maybe. Into... I mean, um, I think sometimes my, um, my sort of scepticism towards a consensus can lead me down certain sort of lines of inquiry. So I'll give you an example from my sort of world. Um, we often hear in the media that um, things like anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are rising in Western society. Now, the sceptic in me, whilst I care for my Muslim and Jewish neighbour, the sceptic in me thinks, all right, hang on, okay, so if it's rising, who's established a baseline against which it's rising? Mm. How fast is it rising? Is it rising for all Jews and Muslims? Is it rising at the same rate for all Jews and Muslims? Uh, Is it rising in certain places and falling in others? And is it just the the sort of the net rise, if you like, is the important thing to think about? And the way I've come to think about it is that when you do statistical analysis, actually some of the findings can be very inconvenient for someone wanting to establish themselves in an industry which is interested in anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, because I've often had to stand up at conferences and put my thoughts down on paper and really gone against the sort of the tide of other academics. And so I've started to think about what are we doing when we say rising anti-Semitism or rising Islamophobia. And I suppose the way I now think about it isn't in terms of a evidence-based increase as such. But I think about the way that, uh, this is a bit sort of philosophical perhaps, but the way that Aristotle in on rhetoric, the way that he dealt with things like topos and topoi, this idea of um, sort of rhetorical shortcuts, if you like. When I see a phrase now like rising Islamophobia, I think that's a rhetorical shortcut, which if you were to sort of unpack it, means here's an issue about which you should be concerned and about which we are rightly concerned and which is probably widespread and which is probably something we should all be um, seeking to tackle. But they don't say that. They say rising Islamophobia. And it kind of, it's like a shorthand. Yeah, it triggers, mm-hmm. triggers that sort of concern. I mean, I think there's a huge amount to what you say and I think it uh, is, is really helpful. The challenge for somebody who's interested in policy and what you do about it is it means that if you do something, you have no way of knowing whether it's actually making things better, worse, completely irrelevant. Um, you know, sadly, I think Islamophobia, anti-Semitism will continue to be problems. Mm. But it would be quite nice to know whether if we do education programmes or we do whatever, it makes it better or worse. Yeah. Julian Hubbard, with your, with, with, with your experience in politics and also as a scientist, when you were a, a politician, you presumably wanted people to come to you and say, this is what I recommend and I know this and this is what you should be doing. This is, this is the recommendation, you know, based on this evidence. Um, or would you rather somebody came to you and said, well, you know, about 80% of, you know, the evidence is this, but there's a 20% that it might not. Um, so first, I'd much prefer the latter. But I think there's also... a a fundamental question. So people sometimes talk about um, uh, ev- evidence-driven policy. Um, the idea that you, you, know, you set your policies based on the evidence. And that's fine in a few very limited areas. But mostly, um, I've always argued for evidence-informed policy. Because we very, very rarely know that there is one thing which is categorically a more sensible thing to do than any other alternative. 
Normally, things have some benefits and some disbenefits, and there's no correct answer. I did a lot of stuff on state surveillance powers, um, and there's a complex relationship between privacy and security, for example. We all want both of them. It is very rare that there's one policy option which is better for everything and one which is worse for everything. Yes. Um, and so it's always that trade-off question. So values are hugely important. I actually wish politics was much more about people setting out, here are the values I want to achieve, rather than actually the details of what the policy is. You know, I, you, know you could say I, I would fund, I, I would push education more than health or vice versa. Both of those are legitimate positions, and that's where the conversation should sit. Do you think there's a situation where the rare cases where evidence has been plugged into a result, I'm thinking of the decrease in deaths following the um, compulsory use of seatbelts, and more recently you've got the decrease in knife crime in Scotland, which has been attributed to better evidence and better use of evidence. Do you think those are sort of the outliers and that they've become the, the sort of main narrative around um, evidence and policy? There, there are some areas, but then there are questions about what it is that you want. I remember having an argument a long time ago with the rail regulator who said, look, our number one priority is safety on the railways. I said, well, no, surely it isn't, because surely you're, it would be safer not to run any trains. <laughs> you know, clearly that's not right. There's a trade-off here. You know, it would be, we'd reduce car accidents if we said you're not allowed to travel in a car or you can only go at four miles an hour with a person in a red flag. You know, we trade things off all the time. But yet we don't think exchange. that, do we? We, no. we don't think that. No. We think there's something that's either either right or wrong. Yeah. And we've moved even more that way, haven't we? In, 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 uh, in the, it seems that society is less nuanced in, in, in making these. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're in an era politically where the space for nuance is much harder. You know, that, that actually, you know, most people who go into politics are doing so for good reasons. There are just different views on how do you make life better for people. It's very few people who actually go in to say, how do I make my fellow citizens' so, life worse? So do you think that the culture, the future, the, the uh, sort of way to improve and move on from the current political times could be to educate politicians and educate the public about the importance of uncertainty and the, the value of uncertainty in politics, how... We don't really know, but we're doing the best we can with the data we have. Um, so I think so. The, the uncertainty around data and evidence, yes, where, where there is some. But it's also to say it's perfectly fine to have different values. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's nothing wrong with saying, look, I care about this thing more than that thing, and you care about them the other way, and to be open and honest. And that doesn't mean somebody else is evil or wrong. It just they see things differently. So it seems to, you know, respond to what Julian was saying about, you know, interfaith dialogue and rise in, you know, Islamophobia or the hatred towards Jews. We always talk about tolerance. Isn't tolerance the ability to deal with uncertainty, the uncertainty that our position, even our position in faith and religion, is something that can be argued that our next door neighbour can argue against and be cannot be disproven, as, you know, for the fact we have. We just have to coexist with it and tolerate. Isn't tolerance sort of a facet of uncertainty? If we understand uncertainty, we understand tolerance, which is sometimes... Yes, if you take uncertainty seriously, you take other views seriously. I mean, one of the things yeah. that um, uh, I, I've wanted to um, uh, write about for a while is the value of argument. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, because if you argue properly, you're going to listen to somebody else. Yes. Um, and um, so I think you're, you're absolutely right that we, the, um, the uncertainty is, is of real, real value. All of us here are extolling the virtues of uncertainty, but there is one thing that I can be certain of, and that's this podcast has got to come to a close. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd very much like to thank you, Ilaria Bernocchi from the University of Cambridge, uh, Julian Hargreaves from the Wolf Institute, and Julian Hubbard from uh, Jesus College, Cambridge. If you'd like to get in touch with any comments, thoughts, feedback or reflections of your own, you can email reflections at nakedscientists.com. In the meantime, you can find more episodes of Naked Reflections and subscribe to the Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientists.com reflections. Do join us next time 